We're going to read from Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, and then we will pray and have a time of word ministry. So we begin reading Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to the Shigionoth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of His praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from His hand, and there He veiled His power. Before Him went pestilence, and plague followed at His heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushion in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling it a calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and ride. The raging water swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the head of his, of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. This is the word of the Lord. Well, this little book that we call Habakkuk, these three short chapters, um, do you, are, are you aware they were written for our hope? <laughs> Sometimes when we read an Old Testament prophet like Habakkuk, it is so hard to get our minds around what, what's happening right here. Some of these names or some of the ways that God is described here, it seems so po poetic uh, that it's foreign to us. And, and we just, well, we neglect it. We move on. We go to the clearer passages like one of the Gospels or maybe one of Paul's letters. And, and when, we, when we don't take the time to slow down and reflect on who God is as revealed in Habakkuk or some of these other what we would call minor prophets just because they're shorter in nature. Do you realize there's, a, there's like a shout of, of promise that the Lord has declared to us that we can't hear? Habakkuk is a sweet blessing from the Lord, this book, this prophet writing these words. It's a real word from the real Lord that meets us in our real lives, really trying to endure. It, it gives us permission to ask real questions, to confess real confusions and concerns. But also, it gives us real answers. Not just a word for the people of Israel some 2,500 or 600 years ago. But it gives us real direction in our real lives for today. For in this book, we read of a real man really wanting to believe. And surely we can all understand what that is. To know that Lord has done something, said something that we find confusing and we're perplexed by it. And Lord, we don't understand, but we're so secure in Christ, no, with no disrespect, we can come to you and question you. We can come not to be sassy, not to tell God to submit to us, but as a child to a father in the security of the, the relationship between a child to a mother. I don't understand. Help. And that's where we find this man, Habakkuk really wanting to believe that God is who he says he is and will really keep his word. And so for us, even as life doesn't make sense, from Habakkuk, we should know God really is in control and God really does care. So when we read Habakkuk, again, we read of a man in a real world, a broken world, a world that had broken his heart and confused him. And for this passage today, we get to sit with Habakkuk. We get to listen to Habakkuk talk to the Lord. And we get to see him turn a corner in his relationship with the Lord, which is fantastic. It gives us direction. It, it serves as a model for us of how to draw near to the Lord, how to respond to the Lord. And so 
in this moment of chapter 3, hear me on this. Nothing regarding circumstances had changed in Habakkuk's life. But Habakkuk had been changed. Okay? I know often our hearts will go to, we want God to change the circumstances, don't we? My goodness, I just prayed for an end to the coronavirus. Is, not, not, is that not a change of circumstance? And I'm sure none of you balked at that and said, that's wrong. That's our instinct. That's right. We want his kingdom to come on earth, right? We want his will to be done on earth, right? That's a change of circumstances. But we also know many times when we ask the Lord to change circumstances, he doesn't. He changes us. And that's what happened to this man, Habakkuk, here. So Judah was still living in sin against God. The Babylonians were still going to come and defeat Judah. Judah was still about to go into exile under the corrupt authority of the Babylonians. Nothing had changed, but Habakkuk had been changed. In chapter 3, he's no longer marked by what chapter 1 calls a complaint. He's not confused at all. He's crystal clear. He moved from a man of complaining to a man of praying, a man of, of, of complaining to a man of worship. What happened? And that's what we're thinking about today. How do we move from wondering to waiting to worship? How did he do it? How did all this come about? I think you know the answer. You, you don't have to study this long to know that it was well, by faith. He trusted. <laughs> He, God had, had spoken, and he heard the word of the Lord, and he trusted it. It's settled. You know it's intended to be that simple, right? Our hearts will push back, but Eric, it's not that simple. No, really, it is. <laughs> There's only one that's good. It's God. There's only one who has all wisdom, and it's God. And he has spoken, and it's really that simple. Now, yeah, there may be some things we need to resolve in our hearts, but it really is as simple as God has spoken and it's finished. So like Habakkuk, the, the work for us, and, and I hope you're comfortable with Christians talking about the work we must do. Are you ready? You ready? Our work is to say amen. Is that a sufficient message for you? The Lord has spoken. Amen. The Lord has spoken. We receive it. We agree with it. We trust him and we've leveraged everything in obedience to him because he's spoken. It's finished. That's the short answer for how we move from wondering to waiting to worshiping. We receive the word of the Lord. I want to unpack this, obviously, a lot more than I just did. So in verses one and two, we're going to see the way forward is to pray and listen. That's what Habakkuk did. He prayed and he listened to the Lord. So we read a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shigioneth, which is some musical term. Let the reader understand. We'll just say that. Oh, Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. Oh, Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So what happened to move Habakkuk from complaining to praying to praising? God spoke, and because the Lord spoke, Habakkuk caught a glimpse of God. Are you aware that's what happened when God speaks? You catch a glimpse of God. You begin to understand more of his nature, his character, who he is, and what he's like. I think I said in week one, it may have been weeks one and two, Habakkuk prayed for answers. Habakkuk prayed for explanation. God didn't give him an explanation, did he? God gave him a revelation. Here's what I'm going to do. But in that revelation, what the ultimate revelation was, here's who I am. And so God revealed his nature. He revealed his character, who he is, what he's like to Habakkuk. Well, in light of that, Habakkuk prayed. He said, O Lord, I have heard the report of you. Your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. Keep your word. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. So this report that he refers to in verse 2 is all that God said at the end of chapter 1 and then in chapter 2. And here's the summary. You're right, Habakkuk. The Babylonians are wicked. They are bitter, hasty. They are ruthless. I see it. I see the sin of Judah. 
And I'm not ignoring either one of these. I will address both Judah and the Babylonians. In fact, last week we saw those five woes, those five pronouncements of certain doom that would come to the Babylonians. But in that, in that, that report, what Habakkuk understood was those who are made righteous by faith will live. The Babylonians, they're not going to live. Those in Judah that do not trust the Lord, that do not amen the word of the Lord, they will perish. And so he's saying to the Babylonians, he's saying to us, yes, you're going to experience the physical suffering that's coming to the land, but you will overcome. You will endure. You are not forsaken. I hope you can rest in that. I hope you're not hoping for physical strength to give you peace. Financial strength to give you peace. Medical advancement to give you peace. Those all promise peace, but they lie. They cannot ultimately keep their word. Only God can. And that's what Habakkuk is saying. That's what God is saying to Habakkuk and then from Habakkuk to us. When you walk by faith, when you trust me, you're going to suffer. But you're going to be fine. You will overcome. You will endure. That's really good news. That's really good news. So we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear what's coming tomorrow or next year or in a handful of years. Yeah, we, we may and we ought to groan about the sin in this world and the suffering in this world. But it ultimately doesn't win, does it? Jesus is the one who said, I died and I am alive forevermore. That's what informs our suffering. That's what informs our going to the store or making decisions about school, making decisions about medical uh, treatments. He died. He's alive forevermore, and I am forever united with him. I have peace now. Regardless of what's coming, I have peace. That's what God is instilling into the heart of Habakkuk. So Habakkuk heard this report, and his response was one of faith. That is, he said, amen. But that was shown through fear, and we see that there. O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O oh Lord, do I fear. So the fear of the Lord was what fueled his prayer and his worship. So often we think when we turn to God and his word, we should experience some immediate relief. But that's not always the case. Sometimes God gives hope. Sometimes God gives direction, wisdom, comfort in some unexpected ways. That is, sometimes, sometimes God will say to you, to me, your expectations are all off. And you need to reorient your expectations to me, not expect me to reorient my expectations to your plan. So sometimes the word of the Lord is corrective, right? It cuts against our dreams and our hopes and our plans. So it's not always comfortable, easy, immediate relief. So God here speaks. And Habakkuk hears, and he shows his faith, he shows his worship by fearing the Lord. Oh, trembling. What do you imagine it would be like to draw near to God? What do you imagine? Somebody said, A.W. Tozer, to know God is at once the easiest and the most difficult thing in the world. <laughs> Why would he say that? The easiest and the most difficult thing in the world. Well, imagine if we could ask Moses. Moses, what was it like to draw near to the Lord? And he would tell us about the burning bush. Or he would tell us about Mount Sinai. And he would say, I trembled in his presence. Okay, Moses doesn't serve us well. Joshua, David, what was it like to meet with the Lord? Well, we fell in his presence. We knew there was no place for us to stay upright in his presence. So we got low. Oh, gosh, he still doesn't serve us. <laughs> Daniel, Daniel, man, what was it like? Well, actually, go read chapter 8. I was sick for many days when God spoke to me. Goodness, it's got to be the New Covenant. It's got to be the New Testament. Peter, John, James, what happened when you met Jesus there on the Mount of Transfiguration? Well, we were filled with terror. Okay, I get it, Mount, Trans Mount of Transfiguration. But what else? Well, that time we were in the boat, 
and we woke him up from his nap and he calmed the storm, we, will f- we were filled with terror in his presence. And we know better than to ask John, who saw him in his eternal glory there in the revelation of Jesus, he fell to the ground as though dead. <laughs> so A.W. Tozer says again, to know God is at once the easiest and the most difficult thing. You see, God is holy. And he's holy, holy. And I'm by that I mean W-H. He's completely holy. Unique. Other than. Unlike. What on earth does that mean? Well, he's the Almighty and we're not. He has perfect wisdom. His motives are always pure. We don't know what either of those are like. He is pure. He is righteous. He is right. He's good, even when we say he's not. And he doesn't kick us to the curb because we spoke against his goodness. Have you ever been upset that you tried to do something good for someone, they got hurt, and so you just took it out on them? All I tried to do was help you. Why can't you be grateful? God would never do that. It's not in his nature. So when we think his goodness is not good, he stays near to us. He's always ready to rescue. He's always ready to redeem and make whole. But we, well, we're not God. And so we're not good. We're prideful. We despise the way of humility. And we look out for our own interests so often. That's the the gene pool we were born out of. You know, like you would hear, some people have addictive personalities. That's part of their family DNA. Every one of us has the self-interest gene running all through us. And we get confused at times. And that's why our motives are not always pure. But they're divided. We naturally want to be in charge. And we so often want God to play according to our rules. You see, in our fallen nature, what I'm getting at, it's a dreadful thing to draw near to God. If there's any dignity, any pride that remains, it's a terrible thing to draw near to God. We get low and we beg him for mercy and we're grateful for his grace. And we ask God to turn our hearts And our minds, God, give me that adjustment that I need. But it's not just a minor chiropractic adjustment. It's new life. We have to die to ourselves and wholly rely upon Jesus for everything. That's what the Bible calls eternal life. And so many are afraid of eternal life. Can I let go and trust Jesus? And we who are born again, we know the the shout that comes back is, yes, there's nothing more blessed. It's called freedom to let go and give everything to the Lord. I trust him. That's what God is saying to Habakkuk. Let go. You're not in control. You don't know all things. I do. Yes, I'm doing an odd work from your perspective, but let me change your perspective for a moment. You see who I am and what I'm doing, and I promise you. You will join me in peace. And that's what we see here in Habakkuk chapter 3. He heard the revelation. He was moved from doubt to praise. He heard the revelation. He began to move from wonder to worship. Why? Because he took God at his word. Is the word of God sufficient for you? He took God at his word. And therefore, he prayed, I think, what is a beautiful prayer that we should all have in our vocabulary concerning the days we're in and the days that are coming to us. Verse 2, in wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. In other words, oh Lord, I'm here because I believe you. I've stayed the course because I believe in you. I haven't given up because I do believe in you. I do trust you. I don't understand, yet I trust you. So Lord, when you come in your wrath, when you come in your judgment, please remember to be merciful as well. And hear me on this. Hear me on this. He did. He does. Because he is. And that is essential. He did remember mercy. He does remember mercy because he is the Lord. 
the Lord, a God merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. It is his nature. It is his instinct. If you startle God from a nap, work with me there because God, we know God doesn't sleep. But if you startle God from a nap, you're going to startle him awake into mercy towards you. You startle me, you may get a backhand. You may get a sharp shout from me to remind you, you just crossed a line. But if you were to surprise God as if that were possible... What is going to burst out of God is mercy. This is our Lord. And the devil and this world want to twist it and tell us the opposite story. And our instinct will be to believe that. And we need our hearts reoriented to God in wrath. Because we know you're just in wrath. Remember mercy. And he says, I bid, I do, I will, because I am. It is good to know the Lord. So if we want to move with Habakkuk from wondering to waiting to worship, we need to pray and listen to the Lord, word of the Lord, which will lead to meditating on and considering the greatness of the Lord. And we need to pick up some speed here now. We want to meditate on and we want to consider the word of the Lord. God inspired these words to help us trust him in the darkness. Are you in darkness? Go read Habakkuk again. Read slowly. Read prayerfully. Reflect on it. God inspired these words so that we would, could uh, trust him in darkness. The Holy Spirit sent, uh, uh, God sent the Holy Spirit to us to teach us and apply this to our hearts. And so God is shouting out to you, you can trust me. I don't know what you brought in here today, but God is saying to you, you can trust me. You can trust him, friend. Don't trust yourself, trust him. What a merciful shepherd we have. So here in this prayer, Habakkuk takes us on a survey of biblical history, uh, recounting the exodus and then the conquest of the land of Canaan. It begins in verse 3 with God came from Teman. And he's basically saying here, through, uh, uh, Habakkuk is saying, the Lord has come and the Lord will come again. Therefore, all who wait for him will live. That's what 3 through 15 is, is saying to us. The Lord has come and the Lord is about to come again. And all who wait for him, all who trust him, will live. And then he gives us three aspects of his greatness. And the first one is his splendor. So when we meditate on, we consider the greatness of the Lord, we ought to see his splendor. And we get that language here. Look at verse three. God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor, his glory covered the heavens. The earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. The rays flashed from his hand and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. So Mount Paran is another name for Mount Sinai. You can reference Deuteronomy 33 for that. Teman is another name for Edom, this area southwest of Canaan, southwest of the promised land. So Habakkuk is recalling the work of God for bringing the people out of bondage in Egypt up into the land of promise. He's taking them from wilderness to blessing. And what he's doing and this prayer of praise to God is he's paralleling the past work of God to inform his present reality. That is very mature. And that is what we ought to be doing. How do we interpret this moment? We look back and see all that the Lord has done and it informs the moment as we go from wandering in a wilderness into resting safely in the land of promise. And so these verses reveal the splendor of the Lord in this. Verse 3, he's called the Holy One. Verse 3, the splendor covered the heavens. His splendor. Verse 4, his brightness was like light. So his, his presence is compared to lightning flashing across the dark sky. Did you see it the other night? It's like the only place on earth where we like go out and play in the rain, right? And we take pictures of, of these things. And we just open our windows and smell the rain. And it's just like ministry to our soul, right? Did you see the lightning flashes the other night? I hope something in you said, all glory be to God for that. As the light burst into the darkness and startles everyone. That's the imagery God is giving us here. Verse 5 takes us back to Egypt. Before him, pestilence, uh, before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. So it was in Egypt, just prior to the exodus, when God showed his glory, his splendor, by sending the ten plagues that destroyed Egypt that got their attention and showed that he, he alone was the God of all glory and might. God is glorified through righteous judgment. Okay, that's, that's foundational to knowing the God of Scripture. God didn't like pinch his nose and wince. Oh, I guess I got to go do this. No, he's righteous. And he's right in his judgment here. And he's glorified when he judges all who refuse to live by faith. But you know, the clearest revelation of God's glory we have in Scripture is not just in the just judgment, but in the merciful redemption through the just judgment. 
2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, the glory as, if, as of the only son from the father, the glory of the one full of grace and truth. So if you want to see the glory of God most clearly, look to the son. So then when I say meditate on the greatness of the Lord, considering his splendor, I'm saying ultimately trace that out to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm all for getting in your boat and going out and, and, and being in the created order and praising God, worshiping God for his creation. But friends, don't let it in there. Take those natural steps to the one who created all things and his glorious work of redeeming all things. Take it to Jesus, the spotless lamb who came to take away the sins of the world. Now, if you think I'm taking all this and throwing it back on Habakkuk, work with me here. He just recounted the Exodus for us. He began to recount the Exodus for us here in these first few verses. And maybe you remember, God gave them this warning before the 10th plague that all who trusted him would sacrifice the lamb, put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And when the, when the angel of death would come through the land, he would pass over those people that by faith put the blood of the lamb over them. When you go read Exodus, you're supposed to, as new covenant followers of Jesus, you're supposed to remember, oh, there was another lamb that shed his blood for his people. But we know his name is Jesus. And so when you, when you read Habakkuk, it's like Habakkuk is saying from his perspective about 600 some odd years before the life of Jesus, he's saying, hey, people, remember that time when the people by faith trusted in the work of God through the blood of a lamb? And we should follow Habakkuk back to that. But we who have been informed, we've seen the light. We say, yes, and that lamb was a shadow of the real lamb. And so we should read Habakkuk chapter 3 and marvel at Jesus. We should be in awe of the, the splendor of the Lord through the redemption that is ours in Jesus. So don't just worship him because of creation. Worship him also because of redemption. The Lamb came to take away the sins of the world. If you know Jesus... I'm sure you've heard this before, but let it minister to you right now. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Jesus took away your sin. You don't need to keep bringing it back up. He took it away. It's dealt with. And he's not, he's not keeping it close by in case you get out of hand and he needs to teach you a lesson. That's how we act. That's not our Savior. He dealt with it. It's finished. He took it away. And so we want to see the Lord's splendor in this work of redemption. But then we see the Lord's power. And by the way, there's a lot of overlap here. I'll recognize that. There's, we see the Lord's power, verses 6 through 7. He stood, he measured the earth, he, took and shook the he looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered, the everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of cushion and affliction, the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. So the, the nations around had heard about this work of the Lord. They had been warned that the Lord, the, the, the God of Israel, Yahweh, was coming with these people. And thus these flashes of lightning. Their spectacular revelation. God is among the people. And so now, there's a little different imagery here. He's standing. He's just standing there. I don't know. It, it, it happens to me every time I eat outside at Desert Ridge. Them little birds about the size of my hand, they come chirping up and they're just dying for like a Jimmy John's crumb and they start to harass me. So being the good, sweet follower of Jesus I am, I'll take something and shake it at them or stomp my feet and let them know that basically I have thumbs and I have strength so you ought to shoo away. I let them know I'm in control. Back off. Maybe you know what that's like. Maybe it's not a bird at Desert Ridge, but just some area in which you've got to rise up. You've got to flex your muscles figuratively, maybe literally, and just remind people. Uh, if you have children, you know what it's like, don't you? Sometimes you just have to remind them. I love this image here. The Lord just stands there. The Lord just looks. So in battle, military commanders will press on in victory or they'll retreat to regroup. 
the Lord just stands there. <laughs> I got it under control. I'm not alarmed at all. And I hope we would see the Lord standing there in confidence and peace in sovereign strength. I hope we would see the Lord in verse 6, just looking. He, he, look at verse 6. He stood, he measured the earth. By the way, a, to measure something is to show authority over it. This week I built something for one of my kids. I had some lumber sitting around. I took it out back. I measured it. I didn't ask anybody. I cut it. Didn't ask anybody. I screwed it together. I didn't ask anybody. Why? Because it was mine. And the Lord measured the earth. A sign of his freedom, his rule, his reign over all. And then he looked and shook the nations. And that is, the nations noticed God was looking at them and they began, to, they began to tremble. Have you had those moments where it occurred to you, God is with you. God is keenly aware of what you are giving yourself to right now. He just saw the way you acted. He just heard what you said. God is looking at you. If we could just remember that singular truth, I promise you we'd be more holy, wouldn't we? The Lord's looking. My, my old pastor, Roger Freeman, he would say something in the neighborhood of, don't do anything now that you would be embarrassed to be doing when the, if the Lord were to return. I think that's very wise. To be in a drunken stupor in a bar and the Lord walks in, that'd be awkward. To have my hand raised to backhand somebody or smack somebody, that would be awkward, right? Just be in a fit of anger. Wound up about the cares of this world and the Lord returned, that'd be awkward. The Lord is looking. He's looking. But he's not ready to just unleash something on you. You've been redeemed by Jesus. He's looking as a compassionate father. What are you doing? Why did you give yourself to that? I've given you so much. Why are you squandering it? Come home. Come home. Be near to me. Well, he's displayed his power by looking. These nations were startled. The tents of cushion and affliction, the curtains of the land of Midian trembled. As word of the Lord spread, it occurred to them, the Lord's coming to town. They were terrified. Wait, what? Israel's coming this way? They did, they did the math. They knew, they knew geography. They knew how this thing worked. They're leaving where? And they're headed Where? They have to pass through our land. The God of Israel told them to come here? Oh, no. And so Habakkuk here is recalling this past work of God and the exercise of his power to strengthen the man of God in this moment. He was in a crisis and he needed relief. No circumstance changed. Remembrance gave him peace. So for us, we need to look back, right? That wasn't persuasive. We need to look back, right? We need to look back and remember the work of the Lord. But we who have the full revelation of God, we don't just look back. We need to look ahead. Because the Lord has promised us things to come. He has shown us the way forward. We need to know that the nations will bow to His glory. We need to know that the universe will be dissolved. 2 Peter 3.10. Make note of this. Go back and read this and think long, think hard. Pray to the Lord in, in light of this. But the day of three, 2 Peter 3.10. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, which by the way could be today. The day of the Lord will come like a thief and the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Startling. The universe will be dissolved when the Lord descends in full glory and every eye see him. Every knee bow and every tongue confess that he's Lord. For us, for his people, what a day of rejoicing. Our champion, our king rides into town. And everything we've ever craved, everything we've ever longed for will be satisfied, completed in Jesus. And on that day, death dies for us. Suffering dies for us. Sorrow, fear, depression, loneliness, isolation, resentment, all of these things will no longer exist when the Lord Jesus returns to set up his kingdom. The Lord will reign, and guess what? It will be fullness of joy for us as the Lord descends. And our home will forever be with the Lord. We... We won't walk by faith anymore, but by sight. 
and the shepherd that we've longed for and we've prayed to and we've seen through this, this dark glass and we've seen all sorts of images and ideas, we will see him and our hearts will rest forever. So we don't just look back, we look ahead. And we look back at how long? Until you return. And again, what's happening is when we look back and then we look forward, walking by faith, again, we amen, we receive, we trust the word of the Lord because we trust the Lord. We have begun to move from wondering to waiting to worshiping because we have pondered the splendor and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we'll see his victory. And that's what happens with the rest of this passage, 8 through 15. Next week, we'll pick up in verse 16. But in 8 through 15, a very poetic description of the conquest of the land of Canaan. He recounts the work of the Lord in the past to give him uh, understanding of the victory that the Lord just promised to him. So we read this again. Was, wrath, was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses on your chariot of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and ride. By the way, mountains in the Bible are so often the most established, oldest, most foundational realities to life. They're symbolic for these things. The mountains saw you. Everything that was firm saw you. And they ride. The raging water swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It's, it, it lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head and we say, hallelujah. That was the promise that he made to, the son, uh, to, to Eve and her descendants. And we know that's what Jesus did. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked. I hope that encourages you. <laughs> that wily old serpent will get his head crushed soon enough. It is sure. <laughs> you crushed the head of, of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. But we remember Jesus was crushed, laid bare in our place. You pierced, and again, language here that we understand, with his own arrows, the heads of a warrior who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty water. So with these verses, we're moving from wilderness to land of promise. Verses 8 and 9, maybe you can envision Moses leading Israel through the Red Sea, the parting of the sea. Maybe you can see Pharaoh chasing after Israel on his, on his horses and chariots to, to track down the people. But what we read of here is God came to town and he had salvation uh, in his chariots. How did the people get through? God showed up and he carried them along. So that's what we're seeing here in verses 8 and 9. You can also see Joshua leading the people through the Jordan River as God split the waters and led them into the land. Verse 11, we have to envision that scene in Joshua 10 where the sun literally stood still so Israel could defeat the enemies. They won that day. Verse 12, God shows that in leading his people to victory, he's leading them like a farmer. He's threshing out the grain. That is, he's giving them victory to claim the land as their own, as their provision. In all of this, Habakkuk is remembering the greatness of God through the victorious work of God in keeping his promise. Our Lord the one that we have talked about, the one that we have sung to, the one we pray to, right now, governs all things. All things. My word. He said a sparrow does not fall to the ground apart from his will. So that little bird at Desert Ridge <laughs> that gives me the heebie-jeebies, leave me alone. It's there by the will of God. Your heart is beating right now. By the will of God, the seas, the rivers, every creature in the sea and the river, there he is. He's over all of it. He measured it. The sun and the moon do what he says. Go back to that moment in the boat where Jesus stood up and the wind and the water listened to him. I think you would get low as well 
we would all get low and say, have mercy on us. Who are we to be in your presence? But he does these things as an exercise of his sovereign might to overcome, to show his might in victory for his glory. But Habakkuk had forgotten it all. The sin of Judah clouded his perspective. and He doubted God. And then the revelation that Babylon was going to come to town and be the ones God used to judge Judah clouded his mind. And he began to doubt and wonder, question the goodness of God. And he had forgotten about the prior work of God. Do you ever forget that? Is the grief so close or the fear so great that you forget God and his work? That's why we have Habakkuk. <laughs> to shepherd us through that. To know how to respond to the Lord. I'm sure we can all relate. But what do we do? Well, we go back to the Lord. What did he do? What did he do here? He talked about himself. If you talk about yourself or I talk about myself, it gets old. When the Lord talks about himself, it's the most wonderful thing we could hear of. If we talk about ourselves, it's oftentimes because of pride or we love ourselves or we don't know who else to talk about. We know ourselves, so we talk about ourselves. The Lord talks about himself because no one is greater. No one's more wonderful than he is. So in Psalm 46, you have a battle psalm. He says, be still in the battle. Be still and know that I am God. And that's what he's done here in Habakkuk. Be still. So friends, do you notice fear in your life? Anxiety? Doubt? Are you upset about present circumstances and you're not at peace, but you're restless? Do you ever stop and ask, why are they even in my heart? Why are they options? Why do they keep? Why does fear keep coming up? Why does doubt keep coming up? Why, does, why do these negative thoughts about the world keep creeping into my heart and, and shaping my day? I believe there's, there's ultimately, ultimately, hear me say that, one of two reasons Fear, doubt, uncertainty, the absence of peace while they come into our lives. The, the first one is we have forgotten God and his work. We just forget that the Lord is our shepherd. And he really does care for us. He has done some awesome things. And he has promised to do even greater things to come. And we just, we forget, don't we? The cares of the world are so great, we get distracted and we begin to look to the things of this world. And I think that's what hurts the most is, is when someone that you love knows the truth, but is not for some reason able to remember it. And they begin to stray. They begin to be crushed by burdens. And this is why, one, we need to share the gospel with ourselves every day. Who needs the gospel most in your life? You do. Who needs it most in my life? I do. And I need to rehearse that good news of Jesus every day. But everyone we know needs to hear the gospel. Think about this. Jesus died and rose so that we can be reconciled to God. You know what that means? He bought peace for us. Jesus died and rose so that we could be children of God. You know what that means? He gave us security in the Lord. He died and he rose so that we would never lose hope. That is, we would endure. He died and rose so that we would have new hearts with new identities. Therefore, we can have holy ambition. Like this is just fruit of his gospel, the benefit that comes to us. He died and rose so that we would no longer be slaves to fear and uncertainty. That is, he bought our freedom and it's ours. It's already ours in Christ and Christ alone. He died and rose so that we could know his loving care. And you know what that produces? Joy. So when we forget the gospel, we begin to lose out functionally on peace and security, endurance, holy ambition, freedom, and joy. But when we remember the gospel of Jesus Christ, that past finished work and the coming redemption that is forever ours, we walk in, we rest in, we live in peace, security, uh, endurance, holy ambition, freedom, and joy. When we forget the gospel, we forget Jesus. And we forget Jesus, we forget who we are. And when we forget who we are, we're anxious. So why Habakkuk? Because you forgot. Or we're ignorant. We just don't know. We didn't forget it. We don't even know it. And there are people inside of churches that for some reason do not know the gospel. 
We do not know God and His Word. We don't even know that peace can really be ours. We don't even know that God does love us and is near to us. That He's good. That He's wise. Because we don't know His Word. I'll say it again. This is another reason why we at this church are going to continue as long as we have breath to emphasize personal Bible reading, personal Bible intake. It's more than a good idea. It's a lifeline. Read the scriptures daily. Memorize Small passages, whatever your mind can memorize. Find an audio Bible. <laughs> Hit play. Do whatever you have to do to bring the, the, the word of God to bear on your heart and mind every single day. So that we're not ignorant to who he is and his promises, but so that we know. We want to be like Habakkuk. A secure, mature relationship that we, when we forget, we can come to the Lord and we can confess to the Lord, humble like Habakkuk, so that we can receive the word of the Lord to recall the past and therefore express hope in this moment and in the moments to come. That's all Habakkuk was. A man who had hope because of the many concrete expressions of God's love. And we are no different. We do this through Jesus Christ alone. So then how? How do we move from wondering to waiting to worshiping? We pray and we listen. And then we, we meditate on, we consider God. And when you meditate on God and his word, when you reflect on the glory of God in Christ, you won't be silent long. You won't be anxious long. You will you will feel a degree of sorrow in your heart that you can't think of another wonderful thing to say about him. And all of a sudden, the cares of the world will truly begin to fade away as your heart is raptured up into his glory. How do we do it? We sit with him and we remember his work.